come to end the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sunshine. But I think it was in 2004 I came across your work and your theories made really sense to me as a teacher and teacher educator and an action researcher. So when you're talking about the living theories of practice, and life-affirming energy and the, the contradiction you feel when the values, when your values are not communicated in your practice, is it was like you were talking about my experience and my narrative. So I'm very, very happy that you can come back and I hope it's going to be an annual event. <laughs> and. Um, we look forward to listening to you, and um, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Well, many, many thanks indeed for the invitation, you know, to come and um, talk again. Um, in one sense, uh, in one, I, I hope I'm not invited back again, and I'll explain why. Because in this room, I'm already aware of the amazing embodied knowledge of teacher educators. And if what I'm saying resonates with you, I think that you will find <coughs> ways of bringing your embodied knowledge in this room, making it public and sharing it together. And you'll find that your research as teacher educators places you at the forefront of the field. So in that sense, if I <laughs> communicate and convince you, you won't invite me back <laughs> to do it. <laughs> I clean up because within the room you will have found each other in terms of that knowledge which you've already got. And this, I, you know, when um, Tamara said, look, um, we don't have much knowledge of teacher education. In one sense, I agree with him that we haven't made it public. But in the sense that in this room, there is a very profound knowledge, it's embodied in who you are and what you do, there is already an amazing knowledge base. And what we've got to find out is how to research it so that we can make it public. And I'll just link up with what Viv was saying earlier, because I was one of the people in the uh, late 60s that benefited from what was called the Disciplines Approach to Educational Theory. And I studied with the philosophers and psychologists, sociologists and history, historians of the day at the London Institute. And that was their view of educational theory, that it was made up of those disciplines. Now, actually, what then moved me to teach in a university, because I was very happy as a science teacher, what moved me to the university was that those philosophers and psychologists and sociologists actually believed that the knowledge that I had, that I'm saying is in this room as embodied knowledge, literally would be replaced by their knowledge. Now, it was stated as boldly as that in 1983 when one of the key philosophers, Paul Hurst, acknowledged he'd made a mistake. And that, that was the mistake, thinking that the knowledge of the practitioners and the way they justified what it was they were doing. And he said, well, we believe that these were at best pragmatic maxims that only had a first crude and superficial justification in practice that would be replaced. And that was the word, replaced, in any rationally developed theory by theories and principles from the disciplines of education. Now that moved me into the University of Bath in 1973 to see if I could help to reconstitute educational theory so that it would not deny the value of the embodied knowledge in this room and that we could find ways of making it public. Am, am I making sense there? Because I think the questions that uh, Viv was placing to us are really fundamental. Now, whether we can develop a discipline of education, this is where I may have a difference with Viv and I'm, I'm not too sure yet, because I belong to two professional associations. One is the British Educational Research Association. The other is the American Educational Research Association. Now, don't, that word educational is very important. Because if you're a disciplines person, like one of our presidents of uh, BU is called Jeff Whitty. And uh, Jeff was arguing we should change the name of the organization from educational to education. Now, what that does for me is give back control to the people in the traditional disciplines. Do you? Yet what I think we could do if we decided as practitioners and teacher educators to make public our embodied knowledge, the knowledge we have in our everyday practice, I think we'd create a discipline of educational inquiry which would draw on the disciplines so it wouldn't ignore them, it wouldn't deny their value, but it would not permit them to dominate us. 
which to a certain extent they still do. Uh, am I making sense of where I'm you know, coming from? Okay. So what I uh, I've done, and this is what I, I usually do if I'm giving talks in different places, is I usually put um, the talk on the web so that if you go onto the actionresearch.net website, you'll see that all my notes for today are here, so you can just access them. And you can respond. I've also created, um, it's a, quite a problem, it's been going for about nine years now, but it's um, what's called Practitioner Researcher Group, and you can access it from here. You can actually go into there, join or leave the Practitioner Researcher e seminar, and you can actually participate in conversations with different uh, teacher educators around the world as you share your ideas with them. So if you wanted to, as I say, access my notes for the talk, just click on there. And if you want to participate in an ongoing conversation, you can actually click and just join and make your views known and share your ideas and papers. So those where, that is where the notes are. And what I'd like to do is to focus my attention on something that I think everybody who was presenting here was asked to do. And that was, and do please correct me if I make some errors here. And also, if I'm speaking either too quickly or I'm not being understood. This is important for me because unlike yourselves, I only have one language. And I feel very embarrassed about that in going around the world and talking because I've only got English. Now, everybody here <coughs> that was asked to present in the workshops tomorrow, I think was asked, to focus on the development of good and researchable problems. You are asked to uh, discuss the current base of theory and the implications of the choice of theory in relation to method and analysis. And also you are asked to discuss the methodological approach that you use. Is it, am I right in this? Is this something you want? This is what I got from the organization of the conference. And I thought that what I would do is focus in on my response to some of these issues, especially in relation to those three items, the development of good and researchable problems, discussion of theory, and the implications of your choice uh, for the method of analysis, and a discussion of the methodological approach. And what I want to do is just ask you about this idea of good and researchable problems. Because I want to suggest, um, from my reading of all of the papers that I was sent, not just the ones that I'm going to respond to tomorrow, I want to come to the very form in which you actually pose your problems for research. And I want to suggest that you've got two people in the room in relation to their doctoral studies. And this is Carrie, who in her doctoral study, and Carrie's was on an action research approach to initial teacher education in Norway. And Carrie emphasized the most important question for her was how can I improve my practice? Okay, so you will just bear that question in mind. And, are you okay? Just raise this up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Which one? Can I raise? Ah, right, oh, let's just see. A whole bit. Yeah, right. just see if that's better. That's good. Last one. Is that yeah. a bit better? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'll come back to that one. Uh, because this is in Norwegian, which I don't understand, but it's taken from um, Siegfried's doctorate, which has been recently awarded. Now, Siegfried, and I want to show a videotape later, just a brief clip of Siegfried with her supervisor, Hilda Heimel, and I want to demonstrate the expression of what I call life-affirming energy with values. Mm -hmm. That through this video, I want to suggest that you might need to create visual records of your practice to enable you to communicate the meanings. And I hope you sense it with me now, because I'm pleased to be here. This is what I literally do for a living. It's what I feel is productive in my life. And I hope you feel an energy that I actually give to what I'm doing in the educational context in which I live and work. But that rarely can be put on a piece of text. You, you know, to try to communicate the difference between how I am with you now, where there is a passion and a real love for what I'm doing, trying to communicate it, in this form, it doesn't work. So I want to suggest we need to move to multimedia forms of representation to get close to our values and our energy. Now, Siegfried has actually looked at her doctoral study 
Um, and this is on developing guiding encounters in practical and didactic education, action research in teacher education's practice. And again, you'll find that Seacree has addressed this kind of practical question, how do I or we improve our practice? Uh, Seacree has done it in a cooperative way, and she's generated what is called the living educational theories of practitioners. Now, your living educational theory would just be your explanation of your influence in the learning of yourself, your students, and also what I call the social formations in which you live and work. So it's got those three components to it. You not only study yourself to look at your educational influence in your own life, you study your influence with others, usually your students, and also because you and I are living within social formations, economic, socio-cultural formations that influence what we do, we can also influence those, and that can be part of our own living theory. Now, I'm claiming that it's only if you'll ask yourselves the kind of question that Siegfried and Cowie have already asked, that you will start to generate those kinds of explanations. And I just want to show you something in relation to the questions in the nine papers that I read. Um, I want you just to compare and just look at and again, I want you to know that I'm not being critical of the formation of these questions, because I think these kind of questions are really important. But I want to explain how from the mission of the biggest educational research association in the world, which is the American Educational Research Association, even the new president has recognized that these kind of questions will only serve one part of the mission of AERA. And I'll come to that in a moment when I explain that the mission is not only to advance knowledge about education or to encourage scholarly inquiry related to education. I would put Viv's presentation in those, that half, that I think it was scholarly, I think it advances knowledge. But the second half of the mission is to actually promote research that improves practice and also serves the public good. That's the language used in the mission of AERA. The British one has also got similar things about serving the public good. Now, if you look at the very way that literally all the questions were formed in the workshop papers, they are of this kind. And if you look at that, how much can the introduction of more informed formative assessment practice increase student achievement in English? Okay, if you just look at the form of the question, how can Norwegian teachers of English best be informed and supported? How do teachers perceive, you know, if they have the abilities they are hoping to develop? So the very way in which the questions are formed conform to the first half of the mission to generate and advance knowledge about education. It also scholarly inquiry related to education. But you see how the I has been removed. Do you see how the we is not a real we? Do you, you know, it's the concept teacher. It's the concept Norwegian teachers of English. The level of generalization in the question means that the kind of question that you could all ask yourselves in your practice and research it is actually missing from this kind of question. Now, that's not to say these kinds of questions are not important. But what I'm really suggesting is that Unless you will grasp the nettle and start to focus on your own practice and genuinely ask the questions of yourselves, you will not place yourselves at the forefront of research in the world in relation to teacher research. But these kind of questions settle the first half of the ARA mission, and even, as I said, the president on Ether Ball, they've got the uh, keynotes and they've got uh, the theme for this April, this coming April's ARA, is to know is not enough. That's the theme. And the reason the theme is there is they're recognizing that researchers for generations have actually made contributions to advanced knowledge. They've engaged in scholarly inquiry. What they haven't done is focus on improving practice, research to improve practice and serve the public good. So this is what I want to suggest to you, that um, certainly over lunch, I saw you researchers, and in this room you really have very profound educators, educators whose values are really inspiring. And my point is, if I can just say something about how you could research this and bring this knowledge to share it globally, you would have a tremendous influence. 
And I want to point, as I do in my paper, just globally to some initiatives that you could link in with. I want to uh, point to the South African um, Research Association. And it's, uh, there's a foundation there uh, for research and education that's funded for three years what they call a transformative educational studies project. And I've put the details that you can access with a URL. The generic question of that project is how do I improve my practice? Okay, so the South African <coughs> the government and the research foundation have funded three years a research proposal to focus in on the kind of questions I'm saying if everybody here would just work on and research, you could connect in with that global initiative to actually share and your embodied knowledge can contribute to theirs. I've also put on details of the first um, experimental action research center in China that the government agreed to set up, this was about seven years ago, for educational action research in foreign languages, teaching. One of my old PhD students has done an enormous amount in relation to generating the how do I improve questions within a Chinese context. And I think you'll be amazed how in English, the Chinese researchers have asked that kind of question of their English teachers, how do we literally improve our practice and help the children to improve their learning of English. And the Chinese government said that every child in Chinese schools has to learn English as a second language. It's part of their statutory uh, curriculum. But this new centre, as, as I say, is focusing on that genetic question. So you wouldn't be alone in thinking, you know, that this is uh, so far out, it's not worth considering. I'm saying in different parts of the world, you'll see also in Croatia, I put some illustrations of how some creation researchers I've got the children, and these are ten-year-olds, to research their own practice using action research, how do we improve our learning, and you'll see a video clip, he's a pedagogue at uh, the Josef Strosmaier University in Osijek, he's got ten-year-old children researching their practice, there are videotapes of using their peers, their ten-year-old peers, as what we call a validation group, asking very clear questions about the evidence that a ten-year-old is producing to justify a claim to know their own learning. So it's not just for adults this, I'm saying that also the students and the pupils can engage in this kind of inquiry as knowledge creators. Now that comes out of good and researchable questions. And I, I'm just, well you'll see as I respond in the workshop groups tomorrow, that I'll be looking very carefully at the form of the question or problem that is being tackled, and I'll just be responding in a way and asking, now is this going to allow your embodied knowledge as a teacher, educator or educator to be made public and shared? Because I, I think that like when you were saying you're interested in the mentoring of the master students and the doctoral students, um, and I've done quite a bit of work myself, I've put up about 30 out of the doctoral uh, supervisions I've done over the past 15 years, and I've studied, tried to study myself as a supervisor of those doctorates and master students to claim my embodied knowledge. You, now, that's where I was thinking, as you were saying, that this was something you were interested in. Again, can you bring your embodied knowledge into the public domain to, to share it? Now, I hope that's clear in terms of what I'm trying to suggest about those good and those researchable questions. And I put, as I say, you'll just see this, you'll be able to access it. All that about the American one, uh, the Chinese one, the Croatian, I've given a couple of illustrations from Canada, um, this woman, Jackie De Long, and I've given you the URL to click on. You'll see her master's students have done some beautiful work in terms of bringing their knowledge and also their values. Because I doubt if anybody here, apart from perhaps uh, Carrie and Sally Secret, I know Secret has, how many of you have used love literally as a standard of judgment, an academic standard of judgment? You know, can you imagine what your colleagues would responded to if they saw love at work on your paper. <laughs> you can't imagine, can you? You know, that this idea that you do love what you do, but you'll shy away from ever acknowledging that as an academic standard of judgment. Now, I do love what I do, and I'm not embarrassed about showing videotapes where I'm expressing this passion in my relationships with my students. One of my PhD students, you'll see it in the Living Theory section of my website, she had love at work as her PhD title. And that got through, and the examiners were absolutely convinced they understood from the video clips what her meaning was of love at work, and accepted that this was a legitimate standard of judgment. 
I hope I'm making sense here because to love what you do is a very powerful explanatory principle. You know, if this love is missing from what you do, I think you strive to make sure that you are engaged in things that you really do love doing. And you'll also see things that, values that you might believe in, but you've never brought to the fore of your research, like, for example, compassion. One of my doctoral students was advising our Labour government on mental health issues through theatre for development. Her value, as a standard of judgment in her doctorate, was a passion <coughs> for compassion. And I think it was last year I showed <coughs> the video clip that convinced her examiners of an Alzheimer's patient and carer. It was a husband and wife, and the husband, they'd been married for over 50 years, and it was the husband actually caring for the wife who got the Alzheimer's. And there was a beautiful moment when the husband was talking about his care and what he does, and behind him, his wife, who appeared comatose on a settee, suddenly started to move and pay attention. And then at a particular point where the husband, he, totally unconscious of his wife, and the husband was saying exactly what he did for her, and suddenly her eyes just lit up and she went like this, and her face beamed with a tremendous pleasure. And the examiners at that point, because the woman was looking directly at my PhD student who was videoing, said they understood that value of a passion for compassion. Am I, am I making sense here in terms of bringing this kind of data into your research? Now if you look at um, this issue, and it's a very profoundly important issue, which is the second one that you're asked to address. And or, again, if I'm going too fast or you want to um, pause or just say, look, I'm not being clear, you want to ask a question, please do. Because in one sense, the more you, that you focus on what matters to you, uh, the better I'd like it, because otherwise I know that I will be talking almost at you. Do you? Mm -hmm. So don't hesitate, please. Mm -hmm. If you feel, look, if there's something puzzle there or you want a question, please do. Because the yeah, just ask one question. Sure. Uh, about this question, how how do I improve my practice? Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand you uh, that that you're telling us normatively that we should address these kind of questions, or if you say to me, you could address these kind okay, of questions. Okay, I, I think I'm going in one way further than that, and you can test the validity of what I'm going to say. I found the very first class I taught in 1967, the 4th of September, in the East End of London, I was teaching science. The very first thing of that very first lesson, I thought, I've got to do this better. Right? And I came out thinking, how can I do this better? How do I do this better? So. I'm making the claim, and you can test this now in terms of your own experience, that all the time you're asking yourselves that kind of question. Now I'm saying that everybody in the room is aware that because of the values you hold as educators, they move you to really focus in on doing something better. You'll be, any class you teach, any pupils or students that you are with, you will want to try to help to improve the quality of the learning. So, I'm not saying you should ask. I'm actually making, a, and it's an empirical point. <coughs> I think all good educators are continuously asking themselves, how do we improve, or how do I do this better? So I'd be very surprised. Perhaps there are people in the room that um, you know, aren't asking that kind of question of themselves. But I should be amazed if I found one, because I think you're all committed educators to come here. So I think you're asking those kind of practical questions of yourself because you do hold certain values. Yes? Could I challenge you a bit on that? Please. In continuation of what Christina said. Um, um, wouldn't you require a more specific question than how do I improve my practice? My practice as a teacher educator is wide, it's uh, multiple, uh, etc. And if I s just say how do I improve my practice, I wouldn't get down and get really yeah. things done. So I yeah. want to have a more specific question, work on that, yeah. and then go on to another one. Right. And I'm agreeing with you. You know, that what struck me about, I love a point that Wittgenstein, the philosopher, made. Okay, so if you ask the question, how do I improve this process of education here now? Right? Now, Wittgenstein was saying, look, if you use words like here, this, now, I, you're locating your question in a specific context. So the question is asked in a very specific way. So if you're asking, like a group of master's students, you're teaching them, and you're aware that something, for example, about methodology is not really being communicated, 
I believe that your mind will already start to ask that kind of question, which is located in a specific context with particular pupils, students. So it's not a general question. You see, it's like the biggest time, how do I improve this process of education here, now? And that's how Wittgenstein, if you like, connected this to the practice. How do I, you know, this, here, now? So I think that's really important to, thanks for that, that the, the questions really are contextualized. I asked that in my very first lesson in the East and I'm still asking it. You know, I teach every Thursday evenings, a master's group, and I'm always asking, okay, oh gosh, you know, that didn't go as well as I, you know, was hoping. What might I do to actually enhance the learning but do ask questions, yes. As I have, uh, can I just answer a bit to his question? I don't know what, 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 what's your name? Christina. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, how I interpret your uh, statements, Jack, is that you say we're all asking these questions and you want to lift them up as academic questions. So you say they're also researchable questions. Yeah. They're not just our private questions for our practice, right? So it's, it's not it's a normative you should, but yeah. it's something we do and it's very, very much so. That, that these are not, as you say, normative questions. I'm saying from your practice, that you're not just asking those as professional development questions, although they are, and this is how we develop. I'll, I'll go on now and just try and show you how, by researching that kind of question, you can make original contributions to educational knowledge. I'll point to you where I can, as I say, the 30 odd, there are about 40 doctorates of their master's students, who've all got their master's and doctorates by studying their, and reflecting on that kind of question, how do I improve what I'm doing? And they've all made original contributions to knowledge, so it's not just part of professional development, it's actually part of a researchable program, and they've got their master's and their doctoral degrees from inquiring into this. Now, I don't know whether this is <laughs> very different from anything that you've thought of, but if you look at theory, so the second um, I, you were asked to address, the second issue was to discuss the current base of theory, right? The current base of theory. Now, if you ask me about the theories that influence me, because of this point about the disciplines approach, I do think I've kept up to date in the philosophy, psychology, sociology, history. I think I've done quite a lot of reading in depth and extent. And if you ask me about some of the theories that have influenced me, I would immediately say, well, I was very interested in the School of Critical Theory. At the last war, when the School of Critical Theory in Frankfurt decided that we're going to create theories which would avoid what they call the mass psychology of fascism, I became you know, very interested in what I don't know, and Eric Fromm and Jürgen Habermas Hawkeye and Marcuse actually wrote about. And I've continued to be influenced by, for example, Eric Fromm's work, um, where Eric Fromm said in his earlier work, Man for Himself, and another one, Fear of Freedom, he said, look, if you can face the truth without panic, you'll realize there's no purpose to life other than the one you give to your own life through your own loving relationships and productive work. Now, he grounded that in his Marxist analysis of what happened and economic rationalism is rife in the world at the moment. You know, what, you've seen it. You've seen it in Greece, you've seen it in Italy, Spain, the UK. You've avoided some of it here uh, because you've got actually an economic <coughs> comfort in relation to what the oil and gas have provided you. So you're not really suffering, I don't believe, in the way that quite a number of the other economists are suffering from that economic rationalist policy. But Fromm said, look, avoid becoming what he called the productive orientation. The product well, he wanted you to become the productive one and avoid the marketing one. He said, under the conditions of capitalism, you can actually develop what he called the marketing personality. It was that, you know, the value of everything became its market price. And you lose the sense of the values that give meaning and purpose to life. Now, that whole body of text continues to inspire me, as does Habermas's work. So are you getting this idea that theory, like the theory of the social sciences, the most advanced theories of the day, you can use Habermas in relation to what he talked about the communication and the evolution of society. He said, look, we make these demands of each other as we try to understand each other. And I always lose these with my research students and say, look, set up validation groups to submit your accounts to and ask your validation group, is it comprehensible? Have I got sufficient evidence to back up the claims I make? Am I showing my awareness of the normative background from which I'm actually writing? Because the sociocultural influences on us 
are very strong. We've got to demonstrate that we understand some of these. And his fourth one, which I think will appeal to everybody here, am I being authentic in the sense that I'm showing over time and interaction that I'm truly committed to the values I hold? Now, are you okay with this? When I say, look, I can draw on these theories and they inform my work. So the traditional theories of the disciplines that Viv was talking about, I do think they are very important indeed, and you can draw insights from those. But not one of them, in any combination, my judgment is, can produce a valid explanation for your influence in your own learning and your own influence in the learning of others, as well as the social formation in which you live and work. Only you can actually produce that kind of valid explanation. You can draw on the disciplines to give you insights, as I was just demonstrating the work about it from and Habermas. And others, I draw on the work of Amartya Sen. I really enjoy his work on freedom and development. But they cannot produce that valid explanation because all the questions are asked in the form that I showed you earlier. The general questions that remove the eye of the practitioner <coughs> from their explanations. Now, if you're going to actually take that seriously about the current base of theory, because in universities you will come under pressure to conform to a discipline. In the UK, I was part of a department of education that got the top rating in, the, in three of the uh, research, what are called research assessment exercises. So I think Viv will know the cost more than I do. I think that I carried along with every one of my colleagues £22,000 every year because four of my papers were in the referee journals. Now that was a lot of money coming into the department. One, I, the department down the road got nothing because it was judged as what was called the 3B department. So all it did was support this group of researchers and help them to become elitist in what this group got almost no help whatsoever. So our research assessment exercise and also the research excellent framework, and you'll be under this kind of pressure, will be to produce your texts in the traditional kind of journals that are not multimedia journals, they're just actually high status journals that have got that reputation over years so that you can actually be seen to be part of that elite group of researchers. Now the problem is, I think, that whilst it will actually move you forward with the philosophy, psychology, sociology, history, economics, leadership, admin, and also theology and education, you know, it can move you ahead in those areas. It will not enable you to contribute to the actual educational knowledge base that will actually explain your educational influence in the learning of anyone. Now this is where I'm saying everyone in this room could see yourself if you chose, and you could see your students as knowledge creators. So if you take that point, I'm going to ask a question and research, how do I improve what I'm doing? How do I enhance the educational influence I'm having? You could actually generate a secret and carry of already done doctoral theses, which actually demonstrate that you yourselves can be knowledge creators in the sense of generating educational knowledge that can be placed in the academy and be seen to actually be worthy of being legitimated as doctorates or master's degree and communicated all the way around the world. But it's a different view of theory. And this is the view of theory I'm saying that each one of you could develop if you wished. And it's what I've been calling since um, about 1988 89. I was president of the British Education Research Association in 1988, and um, I put the presidential address on the, the web. Uh, well, the Bureau did that. But I was arguing that we could actually generate our own educational theories as practitioners as explanations of our influence as we asked, how do I improve my practice? Very different view of theory. You see, the traditional view of theory is that you can explain what you do by deriving, and this is a very important word, deriving from the abstract concepts an explanation for what the individual does. Now, I'm claiming that you can't do it. I'm claiming that you'll never get to a valid explanation of what you are doing in your influence using that notion of derivation from these high level abstract concepts. What you can do is create your own explanations of your education influence, subject them to rigorous validation, and place those into the academy as valid knowledge. Now that is a very different view of theory than the traditional one, and you would have to embrace what it says the discussion of the current base of theory and the implications of choice of theory in relation to choice of method and analysis, do you see how different that is in terms of you saying, from my questions, how can I improve what I'm doing, and generating an explanation of your educational influence in learning, you can actually create your own living theories. 
draw on the traditional theory as you explain why you're doing what you're doing. But as I say, it's a very different notion of theory. And I'll try and respond tomorrow to the papers that I'm convinced that all of the papers at the moment in terms of the current base of theory rely on the traditional base in the universities. And not one of you have actually acknowledged, in terms of the papers that I've seen, that you are knowledge creators. You are actually generating educational theory that matters, and this shows itself in your choice of method and your analysis. So, you know, again, I'd like you either to question or just bear that in mind, because it's quite a radical shift in perception about the nature of educational research rather than education research. If you want to do education research, I think, as I say, there's a lot of work still going on, tremendously important work, in disciplines of education. Now, my point is, if you want to do educational research, then actually bring your embodied knowledge into the academy and get it validated. So that is in relation to the choice of theory. And you see that uh, I've gone into Carrie's work again. And Carrie, as I say, I, I don't know if you can see this, where Carrie is showing how the generalizations from education theories can be integrated within the creation of living educational theory. Now, Carrie uses insights from personal construct psychology and positive psychology within three cycles of our action research investigations. So Carrie's is a lovely illustration of how you can still value enormously <coughs> contributions from disciplines of education, like the psychology of education, whilst generating your own living theory of your explanation of influence. So it's not to ignore the disciplines or to decry them, but it's to reject the disciplines approach. You, I hope that's clear, because I'm sometimes taken as saying that I'm being very critical of the <coughs> disciplines themselves, and I'm not. It's just that in the UK, we have what's called the disciplines approach to educational theory. You see, you see the difference that I was taught, you know, it's just made up of the philosophy, psychology, sociology. That was wrong. It was wrong. But that's not to deny the value of insights from, as carriers use, from psychology. Are you still okay? Or am I, yeah? Okay, now, what I want to focus on is that, and I've emphasized the importance of teacher researchers as knowledge creators in improving practice and generating knowledge. And you'll see on the URLs that I've given you, you can access over 30 of my own doctoral students. There's many more master students who've done their units and their dissertations in this way. And you can access them all and have a look at what it is they've been uh, doing as they ask that kind of question, how do I improve what I'm doing? Now, most of you, are you okay now with this notion of methodological approach? I think if you're uh, master's students, and also the doctoral students, can often be faced by one compulsory module. We are in the UK. Most master's students have to take one compulsory module on methods. Forty years ago, I was doing the same kind of methods program at the London Institute for my own master's degree. Now, when you look at there is a difference between methods and methodology. So when I'm talking about methodology, I'm talking about the underlying philosophical approach to how you do your research. And I, I don't know if these names are familiar, but I try to ask my students to look at, we call case study, narrative inquiry, grounded theory, phenomenology, ethno-methodology, auto-ethnography. Are you okay? That I want them to know what these words mean, but they've all got a grounding in different disciplines. Not one of them is generated from the research of educators like ourselves as we try to improve our practice. And yet it's really valuable to understand how you can use narrative inquiry. Clandinum and Connolly have done some beautiful work from Canada on narrative inquiry. They've got a handbook on narrative inquiry mapping the domain, and it's superb. One of my old students, Jim McNiff, she's actually got one in there about um, how her, uh, living, her story is her living theory in that text on narrative inquiry. But if you want to study how you are answering and researching your own question, I think that you will need to do something that will mean you've got to have a faith in your own inquiry potential, in what Marion Dabbs and Susan Hart called your methodological inventiveness. 
that they're saying that every one of us in this room will actually have a different methodological approach that emerges in the course of the inquiry itself. So it's not a case of applying phenomenology, applying narrative, applying case study, grounded theory, applying those methodologies to your inquiry. You can draw insights from them, but you've got to have the faith that your methodology will emerge as your inquiry progresses. Now, I just take into calling those your living theory methodologies. And you'll see um, every one of those 30 odd doctrines have got a different constellation of values. They've got a different methodological approach, which is actually clear in the doctoral thesis, but not one is identical to the other. Each one has been in a different context. They've had to respond in different ways. They've needed to focus on their own unique constellation of values to make sense of what they're doing and to try to improve it. But that is what we're calling methodological inventiveness. Now, can I just pause there? Because I, I, I would love that to be clear that if you take this seriously, it will mean not relying on anybody else's understanding of methodology. It will mean you engaging, sometimes over three, four, minimum five years for a doctoral study with me. Minimum, those 30 odd doctors, the minimum time was actually it was by Pat Darcy. Uh, Pat Darcy was the fastest uh, doctorate. Um, and that was five years. And she also developed her own methodological approach in terms of her own philosophical understanding of that notion of the shape and meaning, especially responding to the writing of children. Now, could I ask, are you, um, am I being clear as I'm communicating the importance of this? Yeah? Okay, now, what I, I just want to do is this. <coughs> Some of you might um, be a little <coughs> uncertain about the use of I, because it can be um, egotistical. You know, you can say, well, you know, in Norway, and gender comes into this as well. Last year, some of the women were saying, well, in Norway, as women, we're actually taught not to appear excellent. You know, we're actually taught it's not good to actually say how good we are. Now, that shocked me a bit, and then I thought back to the UK, and literally 20 years ago, I think it was the same. You know, I think that, that that sense of the gender equality, the women actually said, no, I'm, I'm good at this, and I, I don't mind. Not egotistically, but with an authenticity that the work of Martin Boover, and I've put this in, says, look, it's rather than the use of the egotistical I. You know, we don't actually, the egotistic, you know, I. If I was to say I in a particular way, you think this guy is just egotistical. But Martin Boover has got a beautiful way of talking about the work of Goethe. And here, there it is, you know, how dissonant the eye of the ego sounds. You know, it, it's very, very different, that, in terms of when you're with somebody. And I, I find this with Secret and also Carrie, that I never feel that they're using I in an egotistical sense. It's always in relation to another. It's always relational. And I, I want to show you um, how this is expressed in, through visual data. And you'll see that um, this notion of energy, you'll see all the work that I've put into this idea of energy, comes on a clip. And you'll be able to access uh, the clip from the paper that I put on the web. And it comes up on YouTube when you click on that there. Now, I just want to show you this. Because in terms of methodology, in terms of underlying philosophy and values, I want to suggest that you can actually do a lot of work with visual records. Now, I'm sorry this is so dark, um, and I just want to check at the back of the room whether you can actually make out what I want to show you, because what I want to do is, if I move this just quickly, okay, so without sound, okay, now, what I've developed is a process of empathetic, empathetic resonance. And what I mean by that is that I move this along like this, the clip. And these clips, they can be quite short, they can be an hour. We can move them along. And can you see there, with Hilda, Hilda Hyman and Hilda's secret supervisor, 
And you can see both Siegfried and Hilda, that communication. Now, Siegfried's here and could actually speak about that, but can you... There, look. Can you see Hilda there? Now, am I going to, if you like, fast for you to say, and I've done a lot of this kind of videoing, that the engagement, the engagement there with Siegfried, whilst I was in it, I stopped and said, look, this is where I feel the full mutuality of your relationship. It didn't feel like a supervisor-student relationship. It felt open, there was pleasure, delight. And my language, you might not like my language, but I do talk about values that carry <laughs> hope, that carry hope for the future of humanity. And I think as educators, this is partially what we're doing. We're trying to enhance the flow of those values. And I also talk about a life-affirming energy but I don't think we can do anything without the expression of energy. A uh, Soviet magician, um, uh, psychologist, uh, Vasilyuk, explained that psychologists had very weakly conceptualized the relationships between energy and values. And you can see why, because pages of text don't, just don't get near to the energy I think that I hope I've been expressing with you today. Yeah, the video can. And I hope, you know, the video, my students asked if I'd make a video of this, then we can actually just go through it next week. And I think we'll see that sense of the energy with the values being expressed with you. Now, I don't think any of you, apart from, as I say, with Carrie's doctoral thesis and uh, Secret, Secret's got this video clip in her doctoral thesis, um, I don't think any of you would have actually brought this kind of data to explain the passion that you're bringing into education, the values that you're expressing. And yet there, as I say, that Siegfried, I don't know if you wanted to say a word, Siegfried, at this point, just in terms of that nature of that relationship with the energy that you were expressing with him. Would you mind? No, I wouldn't mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been working with him for a very long time. She was my supervisor for my master's thesis uh, 15 years ago. Um, so we've been working together and she's also been in my supervisor now, and this was the situation where I could actually tell her what she's meant to me. Uh, and it was happening in a situation like this with a lot of students, and Jack just asked me, what, what's your, I don't remember even what your question was, but we were both there. And it happened, it was like an electricity, and then after he asked, could we do this again on a video? And we said, well, it's not the authentic situation, we don't know if anything will come out of it. But then we tried, and actually, both of us really enjoyed looking at it together later because we felt it expressed something that we couldn't express in the words. So it was yeah, a unique situation in a way, but it was possible to, to make it over, actually. You know, you know what I said at the beginning? Well, I hope you don't have me back again you know, for this. Yeah? And it's because... Have I got Shalva? Have I got that right? Yeah. Yes, at last. Good. Shalva over lunch was expressing his own passion and values in a way that if he was up here actually presenting his account of his research and his practice, I think you would be inspired. It, you know, and it would be coming from the room itself. And it would also place you at the forefront of the field because I do a lot of work in the American Education Research Association, what's called the Special um, Study Group, and also the Action Research Group. And there are two symposia next April that I'm contributing to. And I'll be focusing on these issues in the largest gathering of researchers in the world. Now, actually, if you've been there talking as you were this lunchtime with the evidence from the classroom and the students, that would be at the forefront of the field. I've no, no question of that. And Siegfried's work as well uh, with her thesis. At the moment, it's in Norwegian. The abstract's in English. But the Norwegian language isn't a global language. And therefore, it really does need, you know, that if you like, the translation to make its influence felt. And I've talked to Siegfried about this, because this is just one of the, with the poem that Siegfried constructed, using some of the art of Matisse and also Kandinsky. Also, there are music uh, interludes in it to communicate the work of the creative arts in representing this kind of research. I, I, again, I just want to check. Are you okay with this? Because, as I say, the... the the pleasure I get of feeling that I'm with you is because 
I've already sensed that you are such a passionate group of educators. You really do believe in education. But if I was to be asked around the world, where is the knowledge base of the Norwegian teacher educators that we can access? At the moment, all we've got is one big thesis, 460 pages in Norwegian, with an abstract in English. Carries, we've actually got, and we can actually, it's on the web, and we can access it. Now, do you think, it was that, what were you saying? Somebody was saying about if everybody produced those papers, so you had 200 not papers where people could actually access them, you'd have a very powerful knowledge base on which to share globally. And it would be emerging out of this local network of people that are actually relating well with each other with values that you're passionately committed to. Now, I don't know what this says, but Sigrid, do you want to say just a little about that or? Yeah, because we were researching this question, how do we improve our practice? And, and it was more specific than that. Yeah. We, we uh, concentrated on our guiding practice with our PPU students in a specific context. So it was really narrowed down. Uh, but this particular 1311 is about the collaboration I have with my closest colleague. We're working together very closely. Um, we teach together and we research together. And so this is just sort of uh, praise to, to the collaboration and to what she meant to me through the process. You know, one of the reasons I think you could do something really profoundly important in the world of uh, educational research is to combine what secrets combined, which is not only the ideas that I was talking about, each one of you creating your own living theory, what secret has done is actually brought together cooperative inquiry <coughs> with living theory, so that everybody here and as I say, what struck me about the Norwegian context is that a lot of you do know each other. You've built up relationships over time. You're in networks. And you could actually engage in this kind of cooperative inquiry, each creating your own unique contribution, but doing it together. And you would be a very powerful group of researchers if you could do this cooperatively. So that was what I was wanting just to share with you, is just some of the ideas that, uh, as I say, you might find useful as you think about how to create an agenda for uh, teacher research in Norway because you'll be under tremendous pressure, you'll come under uh, enormous pressure to conform to the traditional forms of research, to ask questions that appear to be general. Yet if you focus on your own practice in each of your different contexts, share your knowledge as it's evolving together, bring the values, the embodied values, the values that passionately move you, and that at the moment aren't in the literature, because this literature can't hold it. This kind of text, with the printed word, even if you're a poet, the poets get closer to it. But you'll need, I think, some creative arts to get closer to your meanings, especially as you talk about what really moves you in terms of your passions. They could be to do with some of the spiritual values, your values, as I say, of passion. You're really passionate about social justice issues, and those don't come through, just the words in the text. So this is why I think this multimedia work is so important. And I've put quite a lot of um, the details. I'll show you where I'll just finish and show you where I've put all this uh, work that you can access. I'll just mention that before I finish. Some of you uh, may be interested in, for example, socio-cultural and activity theory has become very popular through the work of Angus Strong. There are centres in different parts of the world. Some of you might start to recognise this kind of diagram as triangulars from <coughs> activity theory. Now, I'd like you to read this bit of my notes that I've got for you, because one of my colleagues, Carl Alan Rayner, says, look, these are actually misleading because it makes it appear that space can be cut. You know, the very diagrams, all linear, all with lines, that, that space, Alan Rayner holds, cannot be cut. And these representations are really misleading. And I've put you the quote from Alan Rayner's work on inclusion and inclusionality just to try to ask you to be careful about the use of these kinds of representations. So I, I put that in, and the one that, as I say, I've actually just finished with is, um, it's a large number, which I'm hoping you enjoy, um, and they're in the appendix. <coughs> and what I've done is, I've put you a, a, quite a number of URLs from different groupings around the world. There's Susan Nofke's symposium for AERA, to know he's not enough, all related to action research. Um, you've got an arts-based organisation there on creativity, 
And then, this idea of living values improving practice cooperative, the international cooperative uh, research project. But here, I'd just like you to, at some point, just quickly click on these and browse through them, because that will take you to Dublin City University, to one of the most impressive things I've seen in the world about the use of multimedia and e-learning. So these, this Margaret Farron working with a colleague of Monrotti, if you're interested in ICT, she's a lecturer in e-learning and her research is superb. And the Living Theory journal that you get from my homepage has got a special issue from that university. Maureen Laidler was in China, Marie Huxtable, Bath, you'll just get Canada, uh, G. McNiff, Sonny Hutchinson. There's a whole lot of URLs based on the kind of research that I've been talking about. So that's just... As I say, it just goes on in terms of quite a large number that you'll be able to just access and see what's going on in the world. And that is actually, as I say, it's just accessible from the Action Research document, which I'll just <laughs> point you again. I do, I do really like that one of um, Secret and Linda. Let me just, if I can get the. There we are. So you can get all of this from the actionresearch.net, you know, just the HTTP. Um, you'll get all of the doctorates here, the Living Theory section. As I say, um, th this one here, I really, I'm delighted. You have a look at some of these titles. And that was a really good one from uh, Israel. Um, it's all about Palestinian um, teaching Arab and uh, the Israelis together, the tensions that are in that context at the moment. And that gala has faced those. Um, and there's been quite a lot of pain involved in this, but she's been fascinated at how to become a better dialogical educator in that very difficult context. Uh, you'll see, I put different parts of the world. That's an interesting one because it's about engineering. It's the first one where uh, I was supervising where the person was involved in, it was a, a Romanian oil fields, and he used these kinds of approaches in terms of living his values, but within an economic context. Husband and wife, how do I come to understand my shared living education sounds of judgment? These are really beautiful, these. Intergeneration student-led research. She got mentors from the older children, uh, supervising and mentoring the younger children, and she got three intergenerational groups working within her school. It's a very powerful piece, that. Simon's a deputy head. How did he actually create teacher researcher groups within a school? How were they sustained? Are, are you okay with this, just to show you there's a, a real range, but the how do I, the I come into it. Um, how do I clarify? This is uh, from Japan. From Japan. Um, you know, Japanese nurses, and then I'll, I'll finish with this, but Japanese nurses um, traditionally haven't believed in the healing power of touch. You know, to, for a Japanese nurse in their curriculum, touch was not really permitted. Jikanaba College got the Japanese government's approval to try to bring a curriculum for the healing nurse into Fukuoka University, and he got his doctorate for his study of how he brought that uh, healing power of touch through a curriculum of the healing nurse into a Japanese university. It's a, I think that is a remarkable study of you know, real dedication and commitment in a context that was actually not really believing in the therapeutic power of touch. This was a fascinating one. Um, Nelson Mandela has got a lovely YouTube about Ubuntu. And I think you really enjoy this in terms of the relational qualities that I know exist within a Norwegian context. And it's saying, I am because we are. And Mandela's got a YouTube explaining the power of Ubuntu. And uh, even Charles brought Ubuntu. He's Afro-Caribbean. He actually used that as his living standard of judgment. So each of these is a very different standard of judgment to the ones I think in Norway you'll be used to using as academics. Now, <laughs> shall I pause there? Because I'll stop. <laughs> I'm just hoping that some of the things I've said, you know, will it's almost resonate with you. And you'll go to those notes. And then you'll, if you wish, you know, do contact me. Because the, um, the email is just at the bottom of the, uh, the page there. You can always get to me here. Um, you can get to me from there, jacketactionresearch.net. And then you'll just see that up here, there's a practitioner research group there. You can join and leave it here, and we can sustain our conversation. But as I say, I do hope that if I come back again, it will be to hear your research you know, into your practice. Um, and I'll be able to see how you're moving into that international arena. So many thanks indeed for having me. Thank you.
any questions for clarification before we start reading?